Okay, uh, we might get you just to take your seats. We're going to start the um, uh, section number four. Uh, so we've, we've a good bit of stuff to come up and still to cover in the afternoon. So um, if you can take your seats there, that'd be great. Uh, before we get to um, section four, I'm just going to do a little bit. Uh, my name is Michael Hennessy, by the way. I'm, I, I'm heading up uh, the crops knowledge transfer part in Chagas. And um, what I want to do uh, just before we start section four is just to tell you a little bit about an initiative that we have on the go with, um, with uh, Farm Plan, who are outside in the lobby, uh, and it's really around uh, the digital recording on your farm. So within um, this, this particular um, initiative, what we're really trying to do, I suppose, as much as anything else, is really trying to, trying to encourage more farmers, and I suppose the industry in general, to, uh, to record more of their farm inputs um, and all of the actions to take on their farm in a digital format. And the reason for this really is, is, to, is to, I suppose, help the management of farms as we go. So from the point of view of what we're trying to do, both ourselves and Farm Plan, we, Chagas, uh, we've been looking within the industry to see was there a, a particular um, uh, type of program out there that would be easy to use by farmers. It's very simple to, uh, to record the information, but also that's something that, that could be done uh, you know, on your app or, a, a, if you like, uh, close to your tractor or in your tractor or out in the field. But it also had to have an Irish flavor to it. So it couldn't be, there's, there's a myriad of, 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 of apps out there people can look at, but they're probably more designed for either France, Australia, America, etc. We wanted something that was going to suit the Irish farmer uh, scenario. So we threw out the net as wide as we could. Um, we, we looked for expressions of interest. And eventually, um, between ourselves and Farm Plan, we have um, essentially... Uh, uh, teamed up for about three years to try and see if we can push more farmers into recording their uh, information on a digi digital way. So really the program, as you can see here in the picture, is really, you know, it's, it's, it's a nice interface in terms of a PC uh, or even on, on your phone and an app, but it's really to try and keep track of all your, you know, the, the fertilizers, of which is important for in terms of cross compliance, chemicals, which is going to become even more important, and I'll come back to that in a second but also some of the more expensive stuff, the likes of the machinery, but also more importantly, and this is kind of what we tend to find, I suppose, on farm, is a, is a lot of people record stuff on a day diary, but don't maybe necessarily record the yield on a field-by-field -field basis. So it's very difficult then to, 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 to have a look and see what the actual margin is on a field-by-field -field basis, which is really important. So as I said, the, this type of program is, a, is both a, on a PC basis, but also on a mobile basis. So it can either be on a phone or on a, uh, you know, iPod, I, an iPad type of device. Uh, it gives the flexibility for a farmer to, to record his information, whether it's out in the field uh, or back in the office, where it's, where it's a bit more comfortable, either or. Um, but what it also does is once those inf that information is in, uh, into the system, it gives the uh, option to you know, create reports really easily, really quickly, so you can actually look back very fast to see what it is, or indeed, if a cross-compliance happens to come up, that information is there uh, to hand, and, and if you like, correct to, to what's actually going on at the moment. The other nice benefit, I suppose, about this particular package um, is really around the uh, connection between uh, the, the package a farmer is using and an agronomy package that your advisor can actually use. So. We in Chagas, again, we're, we're equipping our, uh, our own advisors with this agronomy package. So essentially, when a, the agronomist or your, your farm advisor goes out, they can you know, uh, have a look and see what's in your field and in consultation with yourself, come up with a recommendation, bang on that recommendation to you as the farmer. You bring it into uh, the, um, the app uh, uh, you know, uh, on the field or in the field when you go into the field. And when that's done, you just basically, a couple of clicks and uh, the, the information is recorded. So the real hard work is kind of gone out of it at that stage. And there's a good few. There's a lot of farmers already existingly using this package around, uh, around Ireland and have been using it for years. This company has been around for an awful long time. Um, and there are a number of commercial companies using the agronomy package as well. So there's, I suppose there's, there's already a footprint of, of this um, uh, software package out there in the industry. So... In terms of how can it help, look, it's like all these kind of things. If you don't measure, you can't change. Uh, and that is a little bit of a problem, I think, in many farms out there. They're really not sure what they did last year, and they're certainly not sure what they did the year before or the year before that, in terms of the management of the crop through those years to know what to do for the next year. And if we heard a lot about resistance already, whether it's in fungicides, I'm going to hear even more in terms of resistance uh, in terms of weeds, and we also heard resistance in terms of insecticides. 
Farmers really need to know this going from year to year to see what actually happened. And if it's not written down somewhere, it's very, very difficult to actually change it. So, like I say, the, the, the gatekeeper can keep track of uh, everything kind of from your, your, uh, the variety that you have in the field or across all of the farm, the variety is all the way across it, so you can kind of compare varieties. Or you can compare crop types, whether wheats, winter wheats are doing better than winter barleys, etc. cetera, um, but also then across farm units because you know, larger farmers now have larger units in it and that all works really well. But more crucially, really, it's from year to year and that's the more difficult one to try and compare, to try and make a decision of whether a system is working better on your farm or not uh, in comparison to normal. And obviously it gives you an opportunity then to interact with ourselves, with some of our own programs, the likes of e-crops, uh, or e-profit uh, e monitor, I should say, to try and compare your farm with other farms. And it's only when you do that, you can figure out whether the results that you have are actually you know, pretty good in terms of the industry standard or your average, or you, you, you can improve or not. So from the point of view of, of getting access to Gatekeeper, um, we have, again, with the, our collaboration with um, Farm Plan, uh, we have, I suppose, set up a thing uh, to basically um, give our clients, uh, the Chagas clients, access to it at a relatively cheap rate. There's basically a 50% discount in year one, uh, 35 in year two, and 20 in year three to give people an opportunity to start recording these type of information at a relatively low cost entry point. So it's really to try and um, encourage farmers to just start at it without costing you a huge amount of money, to see how it suits your system. And this, this system mightn't be for you, but in a general sense, again, for me standing up here, Chagas in a general, general way, we just want people recording stuff digitally so they can go back and compare and be able to make uh, a decision uh, or help in their decisions throughout the year. In terms of um, getting uh, involved in it, um, it's relatively simple. Contact your local Chagas advisor and, and we'll set you up with those discounts. Um, the, we, we will then set, set you up, then uh, send you across the farm plan of where you set, set, your, set, set your system up there. In terms of setting up, can always be the really difficult part. And this, again, was something we were really conscious of, that Farm Plan have an absolutely excellent uh, support service, whether it's a, an online helpline, there's videos, there's manuals, there's uh, questions and answers pages. But there's also, we've set up a scenario whereby Farm Plan will uh, contact farmers once they're set up on a, uh, on a bi-monthly basis for, for a little while to make sure that the farmer's making progress, putting the information into the system. So we have it kind of set up so that your initial setup until you get used to using the system should be a good lot of support for you through that farm plan uh, type scenario. Coming from and listening to some farms who are already a part of this, the, uh, the feedback is excellent. And the feedback really is once you get yourself set up with the farm into it initially, it's actually a really simple process to, uh, to record uh, on a day-to-day on a, on a -day basis. And I suppose once or if you have a connection between your own farm package on the farm with your advisor who's, who's uh, you know, shooting the recommendations into you from that, it makes that recording even more simple um, uh, on the other side of it. So this is something really, really, really encouraging people to do. So, um, you know, uh, Ben Hatton is outside from Farm Plan. He's a stand outside. So uh, please, anybody who wants to, to chat about it, chat to Ben here today or get onto on any of the Chagas advisors out there. And look, if you're not part of Chagas, that's okay as well. You can still contact Ben and, and you can work away with Ben in True Farm Plan after that anyway. Okay, look, that's a quick one. You can get more information uh, from our own Chagas website uh, and also from Farm Plan. There's all the, all the information as regards how, you would, uh, how a farmer would kind of go about and look at the information in there. And there's lots of nice videos there to, that'll give you an idea of what the screens look like and how hard or easy it is to, to put information in, whether that suits you or not. So that's all the information there. Okay, that's it. Thank you very much. <clears throat> okay, uh, so we're going to head on straight from there. I'm going to chair the next session. Uh, the next session is session four. So we're going to do uh, it's, uh, research highlights. Um, and we have uh, about six different highlights, so it's going to be a really short. You thought the, 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 the first bit was uh, fairly short in terms of uh, pretty snappy presentations. These presentations are even more snappy. Um, so we're going to go through uh, about six or seven. We're going to talk about mycotoxins. We're going to talk a little bit more about um, aphids and, and virus testing. Uh, a little bit around beans in terms of the assessment of beans for nitrogen uh, and also assessment for beans for chocolate spot and also a little bit about oat research. So we've, we've various different uh, 
really great researchers, uh, young researchers who are coming into the system set up to, to do that, but also some of our existing colleagues as well. So uh, with that, what I refer to you, I'm going to call uh, Diana to, to the stage to talk about mycotoxins. Diana. Um, I will start my presentation with a very brief introduction on what mycotoxins are and why is it important. Uh, mycotoxins are uh, toxic secondary metabolites produced by fungi that once ingested are leading to serious health issues in humans and animals. And uh, as there are uh, growing concern regarding the toxic effect that uh, emerging combinations or modified mycotoxins have a mycotoxin found in crops, EU is considering imposing new limits for the mycotoxins commonly found in cereals. And for this reason, uh, Mycotoxa is proposing a strategy, a farm-to-fork strategy, to minimize uh, the toxin contamination in cereals and to deliver safer, sustainable, and traceable food. And I have to mention that this is a large project that just started last year, and it, it involves a number of important partners. And it has three main pillars, uh, which are to standardize the methods used for uh, mycotoxin uh, detection in uh, cereals, to detect, uh, to determine uh, what are the key uh, factors that are leading to mycotoxin uh, contamination at farm level, and to determine what is, it, what, what is the impact that um, milling and processing of grains have on the mycotoxin level. And using the information from these three pillars, uh, we are aiming to collect the information that would help us advise and mitigate the risk of mycotoxin exposure. From Chaga's side, we are involved in the project at the level of uh, farm, and we are working on developing a, a sampling framework that would cover the diversity of the Irish production systems, looking at uh, key factors that might contribute to the development of the disease. And among the factors that we identified are the cropping systems, and uh, we will be taking samples from organic and conventional crops at sowing date, and we will be taking samples from winter and spring varieties, as well as uh, crop rotation and establishment methods. Um, uh, beside this, we will also be taking information on variety, location, weather data, or uh, agronomical inputs on the crops. And using this sampling framework, uh, we will be targeting uh, mainly oats, but uh, in addition to oats, we will also be taking samples from a small number of barley and wheat crops. And uh, we will be doing this for three consecutive years. And I will just brief you on uh, the work that was done so far. Um, although the project started halfway through the growing season last year, we were already able to identify a number of crops, and we sampled over the summer a large number of crops, of which we had both winter and spring oats, uh, cultivated both after a cereal and after a non-cereal crops. And beside this, we also took samples from a few uh, barley and wheat crops. The only one that we were not able to cover as much as we would have liked to was the organic oats, but that was mainly due to the high temperature during the season that pushed the harvest forward. And for the first season, we were able to collect samples from 55 commercial crops before harvest, but uh, we also took uh, samples from the harvest, and we will be also getting information on the crops. Using the samples obtained, we are currently working on isolating the fusarium species to develop a biobank of fusarium that would give us information on the sensitivity level in the field and the risk that the crops are exposed to. And at the same time, we have different partners in the project that are working on doing the same kind of service in Northern Ireland or to determine the level of mycotoxins present in these crops. And in the following period, we will start to identify the crops that will be sampled for, the, for this season. So if you are growing crops and you uh, want to collaborate with us, we are more than happy to discuss. And I, wa I want to finish by acknowledging all the people involved in this project, from Chagas, especially Stephen Kildea, uh, from UCD, especially Fiona, uh, Fiona Duhan, who is uh, the leader of this project, from Queen's University of Belfast, AFB, Maynooth University, and to thank the Departments of Agriculture in Ireland and Northern Ireland for funding this project. And uh, I, I'm happy to uh, let you know more about our results in the following years, as uh, by then we will have more results. Thank you very much.
Thank you very much, Diana. Uh, you might join me across here in the podium, and uh, I want to call Max uh, up next. And Max is going to talk to you a little bit about how BYDV can affect how aphids interact in plants. My microphone, but the one in front of the okay. <laughs> Um, thanks for the introduction, Michael. Um, today I'm going to talk about virus vector manipulation. Um, if this is the first time you hear about that, um, so basically plant viruses um, are able uh, to manipulate aphid behavior. This is a kind of new, newly emerged um, research um, area, um, but it has been shown that aphids that have been infected by plant viruses um, have a higher reproduction, uh, they have a higher temperature tolerance, they have a higher mobility, and they also disperse further. Um, since this research hasn't been done on Bali yellow dwarf virus and the grain aphid, one, of, one part of my research project is now to investigate how well the BYDV can change the grain aphid's uh, movement behavior. And also, since we have different predominant um, BYDV species in Ireland, um, if the movement behavior the, um, is diverse, um, if there are differences in, in between the BYDV species and the aphid movement behaviors. So first, um, how can we uh, measure aphid dispersion? So this is an experimental setup. So basically, you can imagine it like a dartboard. You have the numbers 1 to 10. And those are placed in an arena, which are basically um, with, uh, covered with white walls. So the aphid does not get, uh, get distracted um, by any um, visual cues. And then um, we put the aphid uh, in the middle. And then we monitor the aphid behavior, um, how far it goes um, within 4, 300 seconds. So what we want to measure basically is um, the maximum dispersion. We have it scaled from 1 by 10. And then we test healthy aphids and BYDV infected aphids. And if you want, you can count with me. So basically in healthy aphid, it starts to move from 1, uh, maybe to 2, to 3, to 2, back to 1, and it stops in 3. Maximum dispersion was 3. Now we can do the same with BYDV carrying uh, aphids, and we can see differences um, in, their, uh, in their maximum dispersion. So basically, for BYDV carrying aphid, it looks kind of like this. Um, they, they start in the middle and they tend to, to run out. Um, we do that for uh, 300 aphids. So over time, um, one by one, you start to see patterns um, when they overlap. So we have loads of aphids. Uh, it's only one aphid at a time, but this is overlap. Um, most of the healthy aphids, they tend to stay in the middle or do not disperse that far. Of course, there are some exceptions, but virus-infected aphids, they tend to, to run away. Now, one of the main questions is, since we have two predominant um, BYDV species in Ireland, um, we have BYDV GAF, which is thought to cause uh, more mild symptoms, and BYDV PASS, which is cause, uh, thought to cause more severe symptoms. Um, can we see differences in those aphid manipulation um, behaviors? So in this graph, it's a so-called violin plot. Uh, we can see the dispersion that we have just seen from 1 to 10. And for this virus-free aphids, you can see in this plot, um, the bigger basically the belly, the belly is, the more aphids behaved this way. So for virus-free aphids, most of the aphids, they were just uh, sitting around or moving not, fa not fast. Of course, a few were just moving, um, but the me uh, median is down at two. Now we take um, BYDV infected aphids with the um, more mild uh, virus, and we can see um, that GAF, that the infection, the belly is still big, but there's also some aphids uh, moving uh, a lot. Uh, it's getting obvious um, when you get to the um, uh, more thought uh, to be more severe virus strain, uh, BYDV pass. There's only a few aphids sitting around, but most of the aphids are running away. It's, it's crazy. When you put them in the box, they just zone off. Um, so what could the uh, impact uh, of this be as conclusion? Uh, I could show that different virus strains can um, efficiently manipulate um, aphids in different ways. Um, therefore, if you think that in the field, it, it could be possible that some B BYDV strains um, get spread faster and further. However, um, this, is, this, does nothing, uh, this does not conclude the efficiency of transmission. So it could be that different strains get transmitted differently. Um, if you're more interested in that, um, I have a poster outside on, B on virus transmission. And uh, with that, uh, thanks for your attention. Thanks very much, Max. Uh, you might come and join us across over here. And um, just before I, I call up Virgil, but Virgil, come on, come on up uh, along the way. And Virgil's going to talk to follow on from, from Max's uh, presentation and talk about uh, how we can use really high-tech solutions to try and figure out what aphids are there in the first place. 
In the meantime, don't forget, uh, you can ask questions on the, uh, on the slide also. Throw some, uh, throw up some questions there and uh, we'll, we'll, we'll throw them to, to the panel here at the very end. Virgil, stage is yours. Thank you very much. Um, so when we think about monitoring the grain effort, uh, we first have to keep in mind the complexity of the situation. So as Luis told you uh, this morning, the grain aphid is only one of the 25 aphid species that are able to transmit BYDV. And those different, uh, inside this uh, species, uh, there are multiple varieties, or we can call them lineage uh, of BYDV, and those lineage are supposed to, com to behave uh, differently regarding uh, the transmission of the BYDV. So, this is what we call genetic diversity, and we want to know uh, which, uh, which uh, lineage we have in the fields. But also, we want to know if, they are, uh, if the aphids are carrying uh, the resistance to insecticides, and also, we want to know what is the state uh, of the virus, so what uh, virus they uh, have, if, if they have virus or not. Because, uh, as Max told us, there are different species or strains of BYDV, and this, is, this would be important to know which, which one uh, is in which aphids. So in the past, all those three features were um, assessed by three different assays that were not compatible with uh, each other. Uh, first, the genetic diversity was assessed by, um, was requiring some special equipment that needed uh, an outsourcing. So this was, uh, as you can imagine, generating high cost in time and money. And the KDR diagnostic was assessed by PCR tests that can sometimes be prone to false negative. And also the BYDV detection was done by uh, expensive serological tests that were not uh, displaying the information on which uh, aphid strains we had uh, inside uh, the aphids. So the idea behind this new test, uh, aphid mesh, is to uh, simplify the information and uh, the situation and uh, to combine these three tests uh, in one single high throughput test uh, that will uh, give us the information in a more um, uh, reliable way and uh, faster uh, and cheaper. So how did we do uh, to do this test? So there may be a, a lot of information on this slide, but we will, we will go through the main points uh, together. So I already had the DNA of the grain aphids uh, for one variety, and the goal was to compare the different DNA from different uh, lineage or variety of aphids uh, to be able to uh, find out where the DNA were differentiating, uh, differentiating the, between the different, uh, different uh, varieties of aphids. So uh, that allowed me to uh, differentiate uh, the individual using uh, DNA uh, as a fingerprint. And I did exactly the same for uh, the virus uh, identification. Uh, I was able to have different uh, virus uh, uh, strains from uh, all around Ireland. And uh, I designed the test in order to differentiate those uh, different uh, strains. So that allowed me to uh, design a pilot plate composed of uh, 96 aphids uh, that I tested with, the, with aphid mesh. And I was super happy because uh, for the first uh, try, I was able to uh, reach all my goal. And uh, I was uh, able to know that uh, 28 uh, of the aphids that I tested were having uh, BYDV. And uh, more important, uh, four of them were uh, both susceptible, uh, both um, positive for um, resistance and BYDV. So does that um, explain why it's uh, important to uh, survey the grain aphid? Because it's only a um, uh, small part of the, of the population, but still it's very important to know uh, which we have, what we have uh, in these aphids. And we can go further by uh, know the strains proportion between the main uh, strains that we find in Ireland. And um, the main uh, strain was um, the BYDV gaf, uh, and we will also we were also able to different to to know that uh, there were a few aphids, uh, ten percent, that were having co-infection, so uh, presenting uh, two strains in the same uh, aphid. So. Regarding these results, we decided to roll aphid mesh for the routine monitoring uh, of the grain aphids, uh, and we want to test. We are testing currently the, all this, the the aphids that we have catching in the suction tower, 
uh, to have uh, the track of the uh, genetic diversity uh, of the aphid, but also uh, to know uh, if they are carrying the mutation, uh, conferring resistance, and also to have the information about uh, CYDV and BYDV strains. And this would be almost in real time, uh, which is really game changing uh, compared to what we, did, we had uh, before. So thank you for your attention, and I want to thank uh, the person who was working with me. That's great. Thank you very much, Virgil. Excellent presentation. Thank you. Um, we're going to change gears now a little bit. I'm going to invite Kieran uh, to, to the, to the stage and talking about um, beans and uh, how it can contribute to nitrogen within the system. Kieran. OK, thanks, Michael. Um, I promise this is the last time. Um, so what I'm looking at is an assessment of the nitrogen benefit of faba beans to the subsequent cereal crops. So firstly, why do we need to do this work? Um, as we've seen earlier on today, faba beans are supported by both national and EU policy that targets native sustainable protein production. And we're seeing that through the likes of the EU Green Deal and Farm to Fork, but also through Ag Climatise, which targets 40,000 hectares of protein crops. And then we've got the CAP, uh, the protein aid, which is now 7 million to support 20,000 hectares in this, in this CAP cycle. Um, so there are many benefits to beans, but I suppose one of, the one of the ones that we want to look at is the reduced nitrogen requirement for succeeding crops. And current recommendations range from 25 to 30 kilos of a reduction in, in subsequent cereal crops. However, um, I suppose farmers sometimes don't have confidence to reduce nitrogen rates by that much uh, in crops following beans. And, I suppose that's based on our high precipitation throughout the season. Um, you know, so this is research is needed to assess the nitrogen benefit to the subsequent crops in, in Irish conditions. Um, to do this, obviously, we need an understanding of the nitrogen cycle. So uh, beans being a legume in the, the, the blue corner there, we've got atmospheric nitrogen, which the legumes obviously use um, to grow and develop and, and produce grain. Uh, the brown bit in the middle, we've got both organic and inorganic forms of, of nitrogen. Um, and then we've got the, the nitrate that plants in the middle there will take up. And then we have removals in the yellow box, you know, at, at harvest time. But I suppose significantly then we do have crop residues being returned to the soil, increasing soil organic matter. And we also have nitrogen sparing there from, from legumes. And I suppose the red arrows then at the bottom are, are a crucial bit in terms of nitrate leaching to the soil. So the research approach here, the goal is to estimate the differences in the supply of nitrogen from the soil to a subsequent cereal crop, which we call a test crop, in this case is, is winter wheat, resulting from either a bean or a cereal pre-crop. So I suppose in essence, all the variables um, are the same apart from the pre-crop. Uh, soil mineral nitrogen and, and crop uh, nitrogen uptake are determined in the early spring before any significant growth takes place. Um, and then we have no fertilizer application into the, the wheat test crop. And that's to determine, I suppose you call it, the theoretical yield benefit potential of the faba bean. So you can see in the picture there, uh, the farmer will put a cover over the crop when, when nitrogen is being spread. So we'll have these zero N plots within the field. And then um, nitrogen uptake data then would be used to compare the effects of the relevant pre-crop, whether that's, that's beans or, or cereal. So this project is, is just started. Um, so just in year one, look, just preliminary really, but four to five sites had higher yields in, in, to use that as a measure where beans was the pre-crop versus cereals with an average there of, of 1.2 tons per hectare across the five sites. This is going to be repeated and then a larger study commenced across more sites because the number of sites is, is still small. And the nitrogen analysis from last year is, is ongoing. Um, and just to acknowledge the Irish Seed Trade Association for their support with this work. Uh, my colleagues in Chagas, uh, Dr. John Carroll in SETU and the host farmers as well. Thank you. Great, thank you very much, Karen. Uh, come across and join us over here. Um, so we're going to stick with beans, and I'm going to invite uh, Jamie to the uh, stage to talk a little bit about uh, chocolate spot in beans. Okay, thank you very much. Um, so you've heard a lot about the benefits uh, of faba beans today. 
Um, but the problem is that what we're really lacking is the breeding strategy to develop varieties that are adapted to the conditions that we're experiencing in Ireland. So disease pressures are very high. Even though we have some varieties that are performing well, uh, disease pressures continue to compromise yield. And chocolate spot has been identified as one of the major diseases uh, impacting yield uh, in Ireland. So going forward, any new resilient varieties that will be very important to include chocolate spot resistance in those. So this work aims to identify faba bean lines with that resistance and also to identify the genes associated with the resistance traits. And to achieve this, we're screening the pro faba diversity panel, which is a panel of 200 faba bean lines, which have already been genetically characterized. And they are being investigated for a range of other traits, including early frost tolerance uh, and also protein composition, things like that. So in order to achieve these aims, the first step was to isolate the fungi causing chocolate spot. So that's from various field locations in Ireland. And then from those isolates, we needed to select those with adequate host virulence for our screening studies. And we developed the methods to support the pathogen of growth uh, and infection in the lab. Uh, so following this, the disease screening process has three major components. Uh, and presently, the detached leaf and whole plant trials are being conducted in controlled conditions. And a selection of those lines will be taken to the field uh, for validation in field trials. So the first step of that screening method then, the detached leaf trials, for this, we use the, the isolate 77A, which was identified as Botrytis fabe, uh, which is a fungal species, uh, the leading fungal species contributing to chocolate spot. And this was grown in media culture. And from here, uh, we produced a spore suspension, which was per perpetuated directly onto the leaf surface uh, using this multiple droplet technique. So those disease leaves were photographed every 24 hours for a period of six days. And the disease symptoms were assessed as the total lesion area and percentage lesion area using this image analysis software, APSS. So from this technique, we were able to observe that faba bean line uh, did indeed have an impact on chocolate spot severity. Uh, and you can see, uh, so this is a progression from two days post-inoculation through to four days post-inoculation uh, with an example of three different genotypes. Uh, and this top line, line 24, you can see uh, is, is very susceptible compared to the other two lines. And also you can see differences in the rate of the disease progression. So uh, along the top here, you have this really rapid progression uh, of the lesion coverage uh, compared to this, uh, the line 61 down here, where the lesions stay very restricted throughout the, pro the progression of the experiment. So this could be indicative of some resistant traits, but that needs to be investigated further. So the next steps are to conduct uh, assays on the whole plant so we can see if what we're observing in the detached leaf trials matches what's going on uh, during the whole plant infection. So this is being conducted on a subset of the panel uh, using uh, visual scoring and image analysis, but we will also screen uh, the, the breadth of the whole panel under glasshouse conditions and hopefully this will give us more uh, information on resistance traits to go into that uh, GWAS analysis. And finally then, we recently began our first winter trial uh, investigating 20 faba bean lines, and that will be tested under both natural and artificial chocolate spot pressure in the field. So that concludes my update. Thanks very much to my supervisors and all the people listed here for their contribution. Thanks very much for your attention. Great, Jamie. Thanks very much. Um, really well done. Uh, so finally, I want to. We're going to change again. Uh, we're going to talk about oats now. So, Atty, can you come to the stage? Um, so we talk about the recent re or the, the research ongoing on oats. Atty. Uh, <clears throat> thank you, Michael. So I will uh, uh, give you a uh, quick update about the current oat research project in Chagask. Why we need this project, or why we need this work. The, uh, we want to understand more about the physiology of yield stability. We also want to understand more about the nitrogen efficiency in oat. And furthermore, we want to investigate the uh, oat mosaic virus and its uh, threat to Irish uh, oat production. 
So our first uh, project is about the development of a uh, winter oat guide. Now previously, uh, we have seen the impact of uh, spring barley guide and uh, winter wheat guide and how it shaped our agronomic practices for uh, uh, respective uh, crops. So there is a similar need for uh, oat cultivation as well. So in this, uh, this project is at its uh, second year on the ground and we are hopeful to deliver our final oat growth guide by early 2025. So moving on to the next project, Quick Oats. So Quick Oats focuses on understanding nitrogen use efficiency. Now, generally, oat is well known for its uh, better nitrogen use efficiency compared to uh, wheat and barley. However, there is a huge scope to improve it further. So in this project, we're going to evaluate, or uh, we're going to uh, uh, observe the impact of uh, uh, genotype environment and management practices and its uh, interaction on uh, nitrogen, use, nitrogen use efficiency and uh, grain quality. So some of the preliminary results you can see at the poster uh, uh, stand number 13. So our next project is the Healthy Earth Project. This is an EU Interreg funded project led by Fiona Duhan from UCD. So in this project, we are assessing heritage or jamplasm for their agronomic and grain quality purpose, uh, performances across three locations, such as Oak Park, County Meath under UCD, and uh, Oils uh, with uh, Everest University. So this, is, uh, at the last, uh, this project uh, is at its last year, and hopefully by early 2024, we will have more uh, total final report from this project. However, I have few data to show you. Now, as I mentioned that we are uh, evaluating diverse panel of uh, heritage oat lines, and here I am showing you the grain yield for uh, selected materials which were grown in 2022 in uh, Oak Park. And you can see like uh, there are, uh, there are uh, quite uh, diversity among the heritage oat lines. Now, some uh, control variety like timpani from uh, UK, from uh, Aberystwyth University's breeding program is performing uh, quite well. However, there are some uh, heritage oat lines such as this one, 070, which is following closely the uh, timpani as well as it's performing oil better than the other, uh, some of the uh, um, currently released varieties like Husky and Isabel. Uh, there are a few more candidates, like for example, this one, 145, that's also performing oil uh, quite better in terms of yield. Now, the similar, similar, similar to yield, we are also seeing the similar trend for um, uh, a different grain quality. Here I'm just showing one grain quality specific oil. For a specific oil, variety Isabel performed uh, better. However, you can see there are some uh, more materials, uh, like for example, this one, 070, as well as other materials, uh, like East Ormond Arrow, which is actually Irish origin heritage oat line, also performing quite well. Now, one of the interesting fact, which sometimes uh, we think that uh, uh, heritage oats are, uh, are taller varieties and they are very prone to losing, however, the, except for the variety Sandy, we haven't seen much of uh, uh, losing in our trial in 2022. And to talk about the Sandy, Sandy is one of the oldest variety in our collection, which was released in 1850 in UK. So the, my final uh, uh, project is about the understanding of OMB in Ireland. And uh, the, uh, the, the the main objective of this project is to develop a, di a molecular diagnostic tool which can detect OMB in the Irish uh, uh, soil. And in, uh, we are hopeful that uh, after first year of, uh, uh, this project will start in coming uh, March uh, or April. And uh, at the first year of, of its completion, we will have a diagnostic uh, method which can detect the OMB in Irish soil. This will help us to identify or this will help us to assess the risks of OMB and its uh, spread uh, in the Irish soil. However, to uh, uh, successful completion of this project, I will need your help to identify or to be in, uh, identify, uh, to let me know or to be in touch with me to, if you suspect any field which is infected 
with OMB, or which you, you have previously seen there was an OMB, although now this is, that field is not under uh, production. So please be in contact with me if you think there is a field which can be checked for uh, its OMB presence or absence. With that, I would like to thank all of our partners and students who are involved in this project. Thank you. Thank you very much, Arik. I'm across and join the panel over here. Um, we, so we're going to take some questions uh, from the floor. But Arik, first of all, I just want to ask you, OMV is a, that's a soil-borne uh, disease. What sort of yield um, uh, reductions would you have if you have a serious OMV problem? Um, and secondly, how do you envisage, or what do you envisage the farmer test looking like? Is it a relatively rapid test? Can a farmer do it themselves? What, what's that going to look like in the end? So to answer the first question, so uh, according to some uh, literature, that uh, yield can be reduced by 50% under uh, serious OMB condition. And uh, second, to answer the second question, this is going to be a PCR-based uh, technique. So it is not going to be a kit-based rapid technique, but yes, it will be laboratory-based. Okay, thank you. Okay, some questions here. Um, Dan, I want to come to you first, the, the, the very top one there. Uh, it's around the loss of fungicides, and I suppose the targets that are out there in terms of the EU, in terms of losing those fungicides, if we do lose a lot of those, will the mycotoxins build up uh, to, 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 to unsafe levels? And where are we going to go with that? Yeah, I think uh, that is actually a problem because uh, although at the moment uh, the level of uh, mycotoxins in the Irish field are not over the limits, uh, actually the mast mycotoxins or the emerging ones seems to uh, sum up together and uh, uh, get over the limits. But uh, yeah, it could be a risk in the field, but uh, for the moment we don't know exactly what that risk is, so that's why we are doing this investigation. Although I have to say that at the moment, uh, once the uh, grains are processed, it seems that, that the levels of mycotoxins is decreasing with this processing. So if you dehull oats, even if it has mycotoxins, it's very little when it's dehulled afterwards? Yes. Okay, yeah. very good. Max, I'm gonna to come to you with, with the next question there. The next one's about if an aphid had, has BYDV in the aphid, does it express a preference for a healthy plant or a non-healthy plant? Um, so basically, I have not done those experiments, um, but I know um, from other papers that I read, uh, it's also part of the virus vector manipulation. Um, so basically, what we can see is that, in fact, um, virus-infected aphids prefer healthy plants, and healthy plants get attracted to virus infected uh, sorry, healthy aphids get attracted to virus-infected plants more. Um, I have not done it particular with BYDV and grain aphids, but yeah, we, we can see that in many other trials and uh, virus um, vector combinations that they indeed um, prefer infected plants when they're healthy and the other way around. And I suppose a part of your, the work you've done in terms of uh, aphids that are, are infected with BYDV, they want to try and get far away, as far yep. away as the other aphids as possible, which is in itself trying to, trying to disperse the, the, the BYDV to healthy plants. Yeah, um, I'm, I'm not sure if the the, 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 that's the difficulty about um, this, this kind of new project. Like, if the aphid itself wants to get away, or if the aphid makes, uh, if the virus makes the aphid to go further away. Um, like, they, we can see different behaviors, um, behavior mechanisms. So basically, um, there's healthy aphids that tend to sit around and, or walk in circles a little bit. But when they're virus infected, actually, you, you can see them, they're just sewn off. Um, so when you have those virus infected aphids, in theory, your virus will spread further and faster in the that's field right. as well. Okay. Kieran, the top one is for you then. Um, so I suppose it really comes to the heart of, of the project you're, you're, you're doing. Can we say with confidence that reducing nit nitrogen inputs in the following crop will give the result? Yeah, I suppose that's ultimately what we're, we're, we're trying to prove or look at. Um, you know, if we take our, our nitrates direct, if we're anything from 25 to 35 kilos of a reduction in the, the, the following cereal crop, following a legume. So I suppose really that's, that's what we're trying to establish by I suppose having all the parameters the same, apart from what we call the, the pre-crop, which will be a cereal or oats, and that will hopefully determine, you know, the differences between the two. Okay. Um, Attic, just on to come to you there in terms of oats within a rotation, what it would look like is kind of a safe um, oats uh, in terms of the amount of, is it one in four years, one in five years, one in three years? What, what would you consider as a safe spot in a rotation? So it will be difficult to answer at this, uh, uh, right at this moment because there has been little or almost no research has been done on the OMB and its rotation. But however, 
I came across one uh, article, and that was written that uh, a four years rotation is safer. But again, we need more uh, work on this specifically, on this area. Okay, and I suppose the next question would be similar, I suppose, in the sense of if you have OMV, you know it was there in the past, maybe a long time ago, can you get back into oats after a certain amount of year? Do we so have enough information? Going, that's what we're going to uh, try to find that answer in this project. So in this project, we will uh, we'll have, or this project will include all of those, uh, we, we're going to do a survey, and that's going to include all the scenarios, like uh, mean till and uh, uh, all the rotation information as well. And probably from there, we'll have an indication that how we can improve it further, and then we can probably answer that it can be included. I think anecdotally, uh, farmers would tell us who, who, who have OMV uh, in the rotation, uh, years and years ago, they know if they put it in 10, 12, 15 years afterwards, they're still going to get a pretty heavy infestation. So we, we've, I think we, we, we have an idea, but we don't know maybe the, the total yes, specifics exactly. of it. Uh, Virgil, just coming to you in terms of the question as regards the, the aphid mash, will that work for other aphids other than the one you're looking for at the moment? Yeah, so for the moment, we are just uh, focusing on one species of uh, aphid, the green aphid, but uh, theoretically, there are no... Um, no problem to test uh, to test it with uh, with other species such as uh, Arpadai, and this is actually the next step of the of the work that uh, we want to do is uh, test for other aphids uh, because they all have DNA and it's possible to compare to do exactly the same same work. So yeah, uh, later perhaps. Very possible. Okay, Jamie, one for you there uh, around the relationship between trying to increase the tolerance in new varieties, but also is there a compromise in that in terms of overall yield? Will you be looking at that? Uh, so yeah, obviously that's the big thing is that you find a resistant variety, but then the yield is performing really badly in Ireland. Um, so it's a really difficult thing to assess, especially over a four-year project. Uh, but we hope that the field trial will give us some kind of indication as to whether uh, those resistant traits are also performing well. But obviously with the... Um, with the uh, looking out for the genetic markers, the aim is to take the varieties that we have that are already performing very well in Ireland and try to come up with some sort of breeding strategy to, to breed that resistance into those, uh, into those um, varieties that are already performing well. Okay, so it's very much put, putting the, uh, the building blocks in place for, for future varieties as much as looking at, at, at what's around today, which is which is certainly has, has to be there because I, I suppose varieties have to be the, the cornerstone in a world where we're going to have less um, fungicide inputs. Absolutely, yeah. Um, I think a question there around the heritage varieties. How were they managed? Was it a lower high management input? No. Uh, and I suppose maybe that maybe comes to the fact of some of the heritage so, varieties can be quite tall and fall over. Yes, so for the past two years, that was managed just uh, standard uh, agronomic practices. But we have a, uh, from the, I, uh, in, our, in my graph, I showed 20 heritage outlines along with five uh, Czech varieties. So out of the 20, we're going to select five best performing uh, varieties and we're going to include them for uh, differential nitrogen management practices this year's trial in spring. So we'll have data on, um, uh, under low and high nitrogen by uh, early 2024. Okay, ongoing work and more to be, more to be disseminated yeah. afterwards. Okay, Virgil, coming back to you in terms of the AFID mash and, and, and uh, I suppose how that's going to um, flow into a decision support system. And I suppose the real question maybe there is how fast will it be? Uh, can a farmer collect those samples and get a result relatively quickly? What do you think? So that would be the ultimate goal for the moment. Uh, we are only testing the um, the, the aphid from suction tower and also from all the people who are involved in the aid program. This is only because uh, of the capacity we have. But uh, yeah, in terms of time that would require, uh, we, can, we, pass, we are passing from a system that required sometimes like uh, months to be to have their information and now we can go it, have it to um, between um, 15 and 20 days. So yeah, it's, it's increasing the, the speed so yeah, Eventually, it would be it would be used for, for that, yeah. Okay. Well, considering all the bits and pieces as to it, I think that's that's a fair achievement uh, given all of the information you're getting out. I think it's a fantastic result. Uh, Jamie, coming back to you in terms of chocolate spot, are there different strains? And a, I suppose, really, do different strains affect different varieties differently? Maybe that's that's kind of inbuilt in this question here. Yes. Yeah, so uh, as to answer the first question, yeah, it was a, an Irish strain of Botrytis fabe. Uh, so for the next part of the question, is a bit more complicated to answer. Um, 
So uh, there's no evidence so far that we have strain uh, differentiation in Botrytis fabe in Ireland. Um, however, we have got evidence that up to four different Botrytis species are actually contributing to the disease. Uh, so there definitely needs to be more investigation into which disease that we have mostly here in Ireland, whether that is Botrytis fabe and whether there is uh, an impact on the different strains there. Okay. Um... Diana, in terms of organic crops, have you sampled any of those organic crops? Have you seen anything different than those? Yes, so uh, we are also targeting to sample organic crops. As I was saying in the presentation for the previous, sample, for the previous season, we were unfortunately not able to sample as many as we planned for, but we are definitely looking to expand the sampling for this season for more organic crops. I think we are targeting for 14 for this year. And yes, we are expecting some differences between, uh, be, uh, between the conventional and organic coats. Uh, as previous results show that usually the level of mycotoxins in organic crops is lower compared to the conventional ones. Okay, okay, great. Um, and I suppose we might um, maybe just stick with you down for a second in terms of um, that's only one season sampling. And, but do you expect the mycotoxins to vary from year to year? We are expecting this uh, mainly due to weather conditions. These are contributing and we are uh, taking uh, weather data for each of the season as well to see what uh, contribution it has to the difference level we see from a season to the other that we are sampling. And we plan to sample for three years. The project uh, will be lasting for three years. So at least for three years, we are planning to do this sampling to see if there are differences. Okay. Uh, Jamie, the top one there, uh, you mightn't maybe, maybe full answer this, but uh, just get your opinion, at least anyways, in terms of um, very important for farmers to try and get early ripening, get, get things harvested a little bit earlier because the beans tend to go a little bit later. Um, are you assessing that potential in, in what you're doing at the moment? And um, is, you know, do, do, do you think there's any possibility that, that might, might, might um, evolve over time? So we're not directly investigating this, but obviously we're going to record uh, the, the ripening time uh, during our current field trial. And if that has an effect, then we'll definitely be reporting on that. Um, but yes, uh, I'm, I, I, I'm sure that it does uh, have an effect, especially as um, the, the, the rate of flower abortion can be really uh, increased um, when short foot sports affecting the, the crop uh, when it, yeah, during early ripening. But yeah, I can't provide you with an answer on that, sorry. Okay, no, that's okay. Max, the next one's probably um, kind of complicated enough. I'm not even sure I can get my head around it necessarily, but if infected aphids were, were attached to certain uh, metabolites only found in healthy plants, could this be used in a virus carrier trap? Yeah, um, I think this is more like related to like uh, the idea of a pheromone trap, I think. Um, difficult, um, because we don't know really what makes the aphid attracted to the virus-infected aphid attracted to the healthy plant and the other way around. Um, there's also, the aphid also follow visual cues. So a healthy aphid prefers yellow plants yeah, and then the other way around. Um, pheromone trapping, if this would be actually the case, could be a thing, but I think if it would be, that would already be on the market, probably. Um, and then virus carrier trap seems a little bit Dangerous if you you don't want to have virus infected plants in your crops, so I, I would not really attract them as okay. well closely. Um, so it's a difficult. So some of the methods that we have, the the the, the, the towers, the yellow traps, the, the visual assessment. Yeah, like it has to be it has to be monitoring the IPM. Okay, right. We're up against time, and we'll, uh, one last question here. I think Dennis, for you, and the 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 DSS or decision support system you talked about, uh, will that be for farmers, processors, or both? So uh, that is the ultimate goal of the project. We aim to build this the decision support system to be of help for both processors and farmers. But at uh, this stage, is it uh, too early to discuss more about it? I think after the second year of uh, this project, we will exactly decide what will go in it. But uh, mainly at the moment, we only know we want to use an ABM platform to build it, so it will be publicly available. Diana, thanks very much. With 30 seconds to go, so it's only my job now just to, to thank everybody. So Diana, Max, Virgil, Kieran, Jamie, and Alec, thank you very much. It was all kept time extremely well. Um, so we'll give them all a round of applause. Thanks very much for all the information. There.